Hi guys, it's Elisa at Remote Cottage Homesteading. Today I'm going to show you how I make kangaroo con carne and you can make it with any mincemeat, but I'm using kangaroo today and then I'm gonna show you how I pressure can it so it has a long, stable shelf life. And in my spare jars, so the pressure can is full, I'm going to be canning raw packed silver side. So if you'd like to see how to do any of that, then stick around. Prepare your dry beans the night before. We've got three cups of dried kidney beans and we're rinsing them until the water runs clear and then soak them overnight for about 12 hours. The next day, add your butter and a little bit of oil to a pan and then slowly brown your kangaroo or meat of choice on a low, slow heat because you don't want it to go crispy, you just want it to cook. So just lightly cooked so it's brown. separate it all up. I cook it in batches so that there's not too much in the fry pan. For this recipe we need three kilograms of the mincemeat and like I said I'm using kangaroo mincemeat but you can use any type of mincemeat that you like. Preferably the darker meats work best in this recipe. Once the meat's cooked put it into your slow cooker. To that add your tomatoes. So it's chopped diced tomatoes. I'm using four pint jars worth. On a clean fry pan, add some butter, a little bit of oil, and about 500 grams of diced onions. And like with the meat, you wanna cook it low and slow so that it doesn't burn and it cooks nicely. Once it's browned, add in your tablespoon of dark brown sugar. And mix that in. Add in three cloves of minced up garlic. And I don't cook this for very long at all, probably about 60 seconds. I just mix it in. Once it's mixed in, it's ready to go straight into the slow cooker. Add in a teaspoon of salt. Now you can leave this step out if you don't wanna have salt in it. Rinse the kidney beans that were soaking overnight and then add them to the slow cooker. Mix them in as well as you can. This can get a little tricky depending how much meat's in the slow cooker at the time because we're still cooking that in batches and it's still being added to the slow cooker. The slow cooker will be full by the time we've got all the ingredients in. Put the lid on and let that cook for a few hours. Then you add your chilli powder. You can use anything between three quarters of a teaspoon right up to a quarter of a cup. It depends on what the person who in your family doesn't like chilli do it to their taste because you can always add more in later as you're heating it up. We're going to check all the rims of the jars to make sure that there's no chips out and then we're going to inspect the jars to make sure there's no cracks. because the lids won't seal properly if there's chips out of the top of the jars and if there's any cracks at high pressure, they could crack open and that won't be good in the canner because you'll have broken glass and food everywhere and that'll be a waste. So just have a quick look at them all to make sure that they're okay. Some of these jars are actually brand new and some are used. The kangaroo con can is going to make about 12 pint jars so I'm going to have room in my pressure canner because it takes 16 pint jars. So I'm going to fill four of the jars up with some silver side and I'm raw packing it. So all you do is cut off the fat and cut some chunks, probably about one inch chunks. Pack the meat as you go so that you can fit as much in the jars as you can. When I'm using my pressure can, I like to fill all of the jars because it's going to use the same amount of water, the same amount of time and the same amount of energy to be pressure canning. So you may as well fill up as many jars as you can. 
You can fill them up with water if you don't have anything else to put in the jars. But you can always, if you're canning meat, you can use other meats or you can use dried beans like kidney beans or chickpeas, gazabo beans, I think gazabo beans, is that how you say it? But yeah, it's, it's, they cook at the same time so it makes perfect sense to just fill them up. If you've never pressure canned dry beans before, then check out my canning duck video because I pressure can chickpeas in that and it shows you the measurements to water ratio and the headspace and all of the finer details when you're canning dried beans so that they don't explode out when they swell up in the pressure canner when they're cooking. Silver side is a real favourite in our house. I make a silver side salad, and that is silver side cooked and cold, broken up into pieces with diced apple, Granny Smith apple because it's nice and juicy, but you can use whichever apple you like, and tzatziki dip, and that's a salad. And I invented that about 20 something years ago when my eldest child was young, and we were going for a picnic, and that's all that we had in the fridge. It must have been the day before we went on our monthly shop. And it's such a favourite here that it gets requested for Christmas lunch. You can really fit a lot of meat into these jars. It always fascinates me. You have a big chunk like that and it really, it just fit into four jars. Meat needs one inch headspace. Now I will be topping these up with some water so that there is one inch headspace. You can just jar them up like this with the one inch headspace to the meat and they will create their own juices. It's up to you. I'm adding filtered water to give it one inch headspace. And then using my debubbler, I'm putting it along the edge and squeezing in and then I'll have to top it up. So along the edge, squeeze it in and the water will go down and fill up any of those air pockets. When you're using tools with the raw meat, you always need to make sure you clean it properly before you start using the tool for the cooked meat. And we'll get our headspace. That's one inch, one inch. You've got to have it right. Otherwise, the lids may not seal properly. I've got a clean cloth here and I'm going to dip it into the vinegar and clean the tops of my jars. So the rims of my jars have no residue of the oily meat and they will seal properly. Or at least they'll have the best opportunity to seal properly. So we'll do all of those meat ones first. And then with the dry part of the cloth, we'll just go over the top of the vinegar. These lids have been sitting in some hot water just to soften the rubbery part of the seal. Place that on the jar and it's been in the water and my rings have been in boiling water. Place that on the jar find where the thread starts and finger tight. I'm not doing that up tight at all but it's on securely. into the lid while it's in water. Finger tight. Okay. Get the excess water off. Center the lid on the jar. Find a ring that's been under the water. And finger tight. Okay. 
excess water off. Centre the lid. And the ring that's been under the water. Finger tight. These four jars are now ready to go into the pressure canner. I'll clean up my utensils from the raw meat and we'll be ready to start canning up the cooked meat. The concarn's ready when the kidney beans are cooked, so test a kidney bean. If it's cooked, it's ready to can up. Give it a bit of a mix up so that everything's mixed up properly. It smells really good, guys. Try and get equal amounts of the liquidy to the meat. Try and make the jars even. Okay, this is going to get messy. I might need that. We'll fill up the jars, leaving one each headspace. Once the jars have topped up and we've got about an inch headspace, we're going to get all the air bubbles out of the jars by moving it around the outside of the jar and just squeezing in. Check the headspace. With a clean cloth, we dip it into the vinegar and we're going to wipe the rims of the jars to get all that excess food residue off and any spilt meat. Make sure you don't miss any. I've got the pressure canner on the stovetop and the stovetop's on. The raw packs are in there waiting as it heats up and these jars, because they're quite hot, go into the hot water and with the dry side of the cloth we wipe them all down so we'll wipe it down and we'll lid as we go so we know where we're up to get all the excess water off center the lid get a ring that's under the water and screw it on finger tight Using the clean cloth, wipe the rim of your jar. Get the excess water off your canning lid. Place it on the center of your jar. And screw your canning ring on, finger tight. Your canning's not difficult. There's just a lot of little steps you have to remember to get it right. And you want to be safe. So it's a good idea to follow your canning book. If you've got a ball mason canning book, the blue book is really good for beginners because it has step-by-step -step of everything you need to do. And they're tested recipes as well. Finger tight. If you're new to canning and you need a more in-depth video on how to can, then check out my pressure canning duck video. You can use any meat. I used duck because I had duck that I'd processed from Moat Cottage. But it goes into good detail. Even if you're a vegetarian or vegan, I show you how to can chickpeas in that video. And it's a very in-depth, step-by-step -step video for a new beginner canner. Now they're ready to go in the canner. The canning racks on the bottom. We've got the four raw packed jars of meat in there. I've also got the water and vinegar in my canner as well. That's the bottom row of jars. I'll space them out nicely. And 
and your second rack. So you can do your second stack. There's an arrow on the lid, line it up with the arrow on the canner, the bottom of the canner, make sure your lid's on flat. And turn it on, screw it on, there we go. Okay, now I'm going to make sure my canner is on the stove top in the right position so that the flame is in the middle. It can come forward a little bit and a little bit to the left. I've turned the stovetop up to medium high so that the canner can build up heat and pressure. You can hear it's starting to boil in there now and soon enough the vent pipe will start having steam come out of it. When there's a steady stream of steam, we're going to start timing and we'll time for 10 minutes. So first we have to wait for the steam to start coming out. This is where I turn the stovetop down to a lower temperature. Okay, there's a steady stream of steam now, so we're going to start timing it for 10 minutes. It's been venting for 10 minutes now, so we're going to put on our weighted gauge. The weighted gauge you need to put on will depend on your altitude. So check your altitude and check the book to see what PSI you're going to need, um, what pounds per square inch you're going to need for your pressure counter. If you're below a thousand feet, like I am, you're going to use 10 pounds of pressure. The weight itself is five pounds and one ring on top is 10. If you're above a thousand feet, you put an extra ring on that to give you 15 pounds of pressure. So pop that on. The canner will now build up pressure and you can see it's climbing up there. We're going to watch the dial gauge and we're going to get it to 11 because of my altitude. So that's gonna be variable depending on your altitude, remember. So, I'm just showing you what I do. My can is going to get up to 11. Once it's there and it's not fluctuating, I'm going to start the timer. Because I'm canning pint jars and it's meat, I'm going to time it for 75 minutes once it gets to the 11 on the dial gauge. You can see the dial gauge is between 10 and 11, so it's not quite at 11 yet. And the jiggler hasn't started jiggling, it will start jiggling once it hits 11. You can see the dial gauge has reached 11 and the jiggler is jiggling. So now we're going to start timing for 75 minutes. And I'll be keeping an eye on the canner to make sure the dial gauge doesn't go below 11. And you can listen and hear that the jiggler is jiggling as well and that's another indication of everything that's going on. If it gets too crazy and loud, then it means it's going too high. And if it stops, you know, you have to start the whole timing process again once you've built up the pressure in the canner again and you've got it at the right PSI. So let's check in in 75 minutes. It's been 75 minutes, so now I'm going to turn the stove top off and let the can and depressurize back to zero. Now the important part here is not to touch a jiggler because that will let steam out quickly. Now I know you're thinking, oh, if I do that, then it'll depressurize quickly and I can get into my canner as quick as I can and see what's going on in there. And I know it's really exciting and you wanna see what's going on in your canner as quick as you can. But if the canner depressurizes too quickly, then the jars may not seal properly. So be patient, let it depressurize at its own rate. Don't touch that jiggler, don't. And then you'll have more success with your lids sticking on. And that's what you want. You want the, the lids to stick on, don't you? Because then you have more jars on your shelf. And we'll get in there. It'll take time, but we will get in there. The can is now depressurized and we know this because the dial gauge is on zero and our safety has dropped down. So we could actually open the lid now, it would let us, but we're going to wait another five minutes before we open the lid. Okay, so five minutes is up and now we can remove the lid. Now it's going to be hot in there and there's going to be plenty of steam. So remove it and open it away from you and then have somewhere 
you can place the lid down where it's not going to ruin the dial gauge and it's not going to be hot and ruin a bench. Now we've got to wait for 10 minutes and then we can start removing the jars. There's a lot of waiting, isn't there? Oh, they're starting to pop. You've got to have somewhere to put your hot jars when you get them out of the canner and you don't want to ruin any bench tops. So have some chopping boards ready and put down some tea towels so they don't get a shock. The hot jars don't get a shock when they go onto the cold surface. And it also helps with mess because I find the bottom of the jars can be a bit sticky and leave rings. So it just makes for easier clean up if you've got tea towels. When you're removing the jars from the canner, it's a good idea to have a cloth to put underneath to catch any dripping hot water. Make sure you don't slosh the jars around, try and keep them nice and sturdy. And as you can see, that ring is a little bit loose, but don't touch it, just leave it, it's fine. We're gonna leave these jars for 12 hours and then we can start touching the rings. Caddy makes the house smell so good. I wish you could smell it. It's beautiful. Look how delicious that is. Can you see that? That looks pretty good. Make sure you put your jars somewhere out of reach where they're not going to get touched because they're going to be hot for a long time and you don't want anyone to burn themselves, especially small children and pets. Now, they also need to be out of reach and sort of out of the way where someone's not going to be tempted to touch the rings because you, you want them to seal and sometimes people want to play with the rings. So make sure you tell everyone not to touch them. We'll check in in 12 hours and then we'll be able to see how it's all going then. I love waking up to freshly canned jars and we're going to check them to see if they all sealed and take the rings off. Then we can wash them up in warm soapy water to get all the residue off and we can put them away for storage. Okay, they've all sealed. That one didn't. So there's one that didn't seal and that's the silver side, the silver side meat. That's what it looks like canned up. So I will put that in the fridge and we can have that for lunch. Remove the rings. These haven't been loosened up or anything. This is just how easy it should be to take your rings off. If you want to learn more about pressure canning or see some of my recipes, I'll leave the link in the description below for you so you can check that playlist out. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. And I forgot to mention to wash and dry your jars as well as label and date them before you put them away.